Tip Tour America's Winter Preliminary. I'm Robert Wer the Wing, joined on the desk by Kevin Hobdestad and Brian Kibler. Uh, we just witnessed a match, obviously featuring Kogleron. Very well played, one of the top players in the South American region. And now we're gonna get to see him go up against Chess Dude. And I'll be honest, this is a player I haven't heard too much about, but you know, Kevin, I heard you earlier talking about him. And what can you tell us about Chess Dude? Well, what we know so far about Chess Dude is that he is playing out of Washington DC up on the East Coast. And he is the only player in the tournament at this point running a totally unique lineup of deck lists. He's playing Priest and Rogue, which are the two least represented classes in the America's Winter Preliminary, which I think is really exciting. Right, yeah, we actually saw that Gogoron chose to ban out the Priest deck uh, from Chess Dude. And Priest is one of those decks where, you know, as you said, we don't see it too often. But recent Control Priest has been such a nuisance to so many players. Like, I don't really feel like they, seeing my things be entombed, which is kind of like, kind of has the old feeling of the 8-mana Mind Control. Like, you just, you don't want to deal with it. You know, obviously all the board removal combo. So, Brian, what do you make of that? Uh, it's it's not really clear that we necessarily have a great insight into the player's strategy, but Coglorn is a, is a player who I actually have run into qu quite a few times on ladder myself. I believe he was actually uh, finished in the third, fourth place slot just last year for the uh, the Latin American representative to the Americas Championship. So he's a player who has had a lot of success already and is looking to build upon that here. Yeah, we did see, obviously, he had a pretty commanding performance uh, against Muzzy last series. And uh, you bring that up, the fact that he almost made it to the Americas Championship. So if you did watch last year, it was... Uh, Korea as well as Molagel making it, representing that region, but he was right up there close, and uh, he's another player, like you said, uh, he hanged around top ladder ranks. I've actually played him against him a few times and lost every single time. He's one of those players that I just queue up, and I'm like, ah, well, I'm just going to lose this, <laughs> but uh, Chess Dude, a little bit less experience playing against. Be curious to see what he brings, and you know, we see him bringing this unique roster in these decks that you don't tend to see a lot in. Obviously, there's kind of an advantage of that in the beginning, because people don't necessarily know what to expect. So maybe they didn't prepare to deal with that against their lineups, but you know, overall, do you necessarily think, Kevin, that this is something that is a good, viable, long-term strategy in tournament? You know, interestingly enough, we actually talk about this on the podcast a lot, and we right. always talk about in the meta whether you want to join the meta and play with the decks that have established themselves and proven to be strong, or beat the meta. And I honestly believe that there is a lot to be said for beating the meta. We saw that with Chalky earlier. He was able to really just skid past his opponents and do a lot of work using those decks that are designed to exploit the weaknesses of all those top-tier decks. Even though they are the most refined, the most successful, the most consistent on the ladder right now, there are ways that you can do a lot of work in a tournament environment like this where right. you just exploit the holes in those particular archetypes. Right, Brian, do you think there's any possible risk when you lose that element of surprise, however? Uh, there certainly is, but in many cases, the way that people approach something like Conquest is usually in one of two ways. One is that you just sort of play what you feel are the, the independently strongest decks, and you just have a lineup, and it's like, okay, I, I have these good decks, you have to beat me. Uh, the next is that you sort of identify some sort of common thread between those decks, right. and you try to specifically attack that. We saw that uh, was the strategy that Tice and Oskaka used last year at the World Championship. They recognized that they felt like aggressive decks were going to be very popular in that tournament, and they built their lineup to beat them. Uh, I think that there's, there's an opportunity to sometimes actually even go a little bit beyond that and think, okay, I think that, that this is sort of the level one strategy. I'm going to play decks that are good against what I think the expected decks are. Uh, and then you, you recognize what you think people might do, and you, you try to react to that and build decks to, to beat that. And I think that's actually kind of what Life Coach did last year. Right. Uh, he had decks that were all great against Freeze Mage, uh, and he expected the, the strongest players to play Freeze Mage. It didn't quite pan out from the end because he didn't get the matchups that he wanted, but that's one of the levels that you can go to in, in this sort of format. Right, and conversely, we actually saw uh, last weekend at the Europe Winter Preliminary, Tars taking it a step farther than that, which is <laughs> he didn't want to commit to to kind of that second layer of strategy. He went the 1.5 route, which is, you know, he's Curse of Reform. I'm just going to put this in there to do with all the Freeze Mages. I don't want to necessarily have to bring decks that specifically beat Freeze Mage. So th as you said, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of approach the Conquest format. And, you know, for Chess Dude, it looks like his lineup is just a little bit uh, outside the norm, but Kogoron kind of brought that that more standard, aggressive kind of mid-range style and you know, obviously served him last uh, series pretty well. Yeah, and I don't know really much about Chess Dude, but based on his name, I'm going to guess he has some some uh, idea of thinking and thinking ahead in strategy. Yeah, he, he's yeah. probably played some strategy games before. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, Chess dude one two three is a name that says <laughs> to me is a very uh, strategic player. So curious to see what he brings in. And for Kogloron, now this is still upper bracket. Mm -hmm. Neither of these players has tasted the bitter defeat yet. Obviously, uh, some of the players we're more familiar with have actually fallen to that lower bracket. VLPS being one of the most recent ones. And you know, I believe this is one of those players you were saying who you were expecting to see a lot from. 
uh, in this tournament. And uh, Demigod as well, another player that is actually, I believe, completely out of the tournament now. And that's a player I actually met up with Legend at Legendary Series Season 2, I believe, last mm -hmm. season. And so we are starting to see as the upper bracket continues that some of these players who are a little bit more well-established and more well-known are kind of falling. Does this surprise you at all, Kevin? Not at all. I think after last weekend, we really established that there is a, a level of talent at which there's a lot of skill involved in playing at this level, and almost anybody has the potential to really sneak through and do a lot of damage. Last weekend, the way that worked out was very few of the established players, streamers, professionals really showed up and had the ability to crack that top eight. But in general, I think there's something to be said for the new talent that has correctly predicted what's going to show up and how they're doing when they get to this level. Right, so seeing again those uh, classes the players brought, Koglorin bringing the Warrior, Druid, Paladin, Warlock, has his Warrior band out. Chest Dude bringing Druid, Rogue, Priest, and Mage, and has the Mage band out. Now, if you're Koglorin, why do you ban this Mage, Brian? Uh, it's, it's interesting because I, I have to think that maybe he has, uh, he expects it to be a, a Freeze Mage, and maybe he feels like he has multiple decks that are vulnerable to Freeze Mage. Perhaps his, uh, he's playing a Zoo Warlock deck, uh, and, and Paladin in general tends to be structurally weak to Freeze Mage, as we saw earlier in the day. Yeah, the ability to just have these sticky minions on the board, just keep ramping up very, very slowly over time. Serves the Paladin well, though that matchup I, I think is more even than most people give it credit for. Uh, Warrior, why do you ban that, Kevin? I mean, looking at the lineups here and showing Kogleron having all of those really strong decks, we kind of have to look at Chess Dude and think, he's running lists that don't have the ability to deal the raw damage to get through the armor buildup in Warrior, period, regardless of archetype. He doesn't want to take the risk of being flat out denied in either the Priest or Rogue matchups. So he's probably, and looking at the fact that he brought Mage as well, if it was a Freeze Mage, Warrior is the natural counter to that as well. Right, I do want to point out now, with the rise of uh, this kind of more fatigue-oriented priest deck that has Elise, has these cards uh, like Entomb that just, you know, give control where your fits, have to assume that Chess Dude believes this warrior uh, was patron. Because if you do see the opportunity to play against Control Warrior, maybe that's something where you can scoop an easy win. Control Priest does such a great job of beating Control Warrior because Control Warrior gets with late game threats and just. I think it's actually better against Patron Warrior, if anything. Right. I, I think I think that, that Priest actually typically lines up very well against Warrior. So I have to expect that if Chess Dude feels his lineup is weak to Warrior, it's likely his Rogue and his Mage. Right. Because if that is Freeze Mage, you don't want to play against any type of Warrior. You yeah. can beat Patron Warrior. It's not an easy matchup. Control right. Warrior is much harder. And if it is like an oil rogue style of deck, uh, that's, a, that's a deck that typically has a lot of difficulty dealing enough damage to get through the armor of, of a control warrior deck. Right, so Chess Dude bringing that kind of unique suite of decks, but kind of remains to be seen whether these decks will have kind of the interesting tech choices that we kind of saw from Fibonacci. Fibonacci, obviously someone who takes these popularized decks and kind of turns them on their ear a little bit, you know, inclusions like Malagos, uh, Tournament Medic, kind of make these decks very specific. But with Chess Dude, as a player, it'll be interesting to see going into the series whether or not he's someone who iterates on just deck types in general, or if he's actually in there, like, messing with the nitty-gritty, like what we see kind of under City Valiant in Rogue, which is something we saw from Timotim. Uh, and I don't know that there's necessarily a lot of value to that in a tournament like this, because as we saw, Fibonacci, you know, we praised him for his innovation, and then when, you know, he kind of started to go against him, we were like, maybe you put Fireball back in your deck. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at the fact that he brought Rogue at all and thinking, were it me, Rogue is the type of class that really does well against the board control classes. It beats Ro or, uh, Zoo Warlock. It right. tends to generally beat Paladin. And those are classes that we, as we've established earlier in the tournament, expected to see a lot of. So as a tech choice, I imagine that would be why you would choose to bring it. And he didn't get exactly the matchups he would have liked in this particular lineup against uh, his opponent. So that's it's a tough place to be in some respects. Yeah, I'm most curious to see exactly what the composition is of that Priest deck. Because Priest, I, I don't believe we've actually seen Priest uh, on the stage so far in, in this event. And if I, if I could remember correctly, not even last weekend either. So we've talked about sort of how many of these classes are a little bit underplayed. I think Priest may be the least represented. And uh, you know, we, we've seen there's the builds like you were discussing, the really heavy control builds within Tomb, maybe with Elise. It, maybe that's the direction he's going, maybe it's something else. Right, and I do want to let you guys know at home, while we are eager to get into this next series of matches, we are unfortunately dealing with some technical issues, which is why we're up here just uh, sitting here constantly bantering back and forth. Don't worry, we understand you would rather be watching Hearthstone, and we would rather be casting it. So uh, <laughs> while we continue to wait here, I do want to point out the prevalence of Rogue. 
Uh, this is a class that the Hearthstone World Championship, we saw a fair bit of it from Oskaka. We saw it from Tyus. We saw it from Hotform. You kind of brought up the fact that it's really good at dealing with uh, classes that are, you know, very good at, at just sprawling minions on the board. And you know what? We're in the match. All so right, let's go ahead and go. hop As soon as that. you say we're, we're delayed, here we are. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, so we see uh, we're going to... Kuzlorin's going to open up with that Paladin deck. I've already seen it once again. Seeker Keeper, in case you didn't catch the last series, gives away what it does. And uh, this is kind of interesting now. That Rogue has a very good matchup on paper, and in my experience, in practice against Seeker Paladin. Yeah, absolutely. I think looking at the opportunity here that Chess Dude has, he is opening with Backstab and I Coin. The ability to curve out really nicely as the Rogue player here, which you don't always get. I think this is a real opportunity for Chess Dude to take an easy first win in a matchup that he is absolutely going to have all of the tools in hand necessary to respond to his opponent. Coglorn does have a couple of, of pretty strong cards for this opening. Uh, both the Minibot and the Haunted Creeper are pretty resilient to the removal that Chess Dude is able to bring to bear here. Um, but I, I agree that, that this is a matchup that typically does tend to go the Rogue's way. Right, so Sap, you know, you might not think necessarily, oh, it's great against Mysterious Challenger, but Sap has traditionally existed in this space where on turn five or turn six, when your opponent plays a minion that takes all the mana, and that's kind of everything they're committing to it, putting it back in the hand and being able to develop a second threat at times is so brutal against those types of mid-range classes, like Seeker Paladin very much is, but Kogloran's just gonna load up the board, and this is definitely one of those situations where when you play against the Rogue, you wonder, is there Deadly Poison? Is there an early Blade Flurry? And, uh, you know, some of the casting videos, Kevin, obviously you were one of the, the people who, who were a part of that initiative. Uh, obviously, I play very scared against the, the Deadly Poison Blade Flurry, but Kogoran, not so much. He's like, I'm going to make you have it. I don't think he has a choice here, right? To look at his hand, to look at what he's got available to him. Secret Paladin often doesn't run a lot of draw, and he's in a position where he just needs to apply all the damage he can, put as many threats on the board as he can. He doesn't have a lot of other choices. Brian, looking at this now, where Chess Dude just tempos out the SI7 agent, doesn't use what would have been a very, very powerful effect from the card to get rid of the Secret Keeper. What do you make of that? Well, I think that he, he's looking at the fact that he believes coin is going to be important to his overall tempo in this game. Uh, he could have used the coin to effectively be a backstab. He could have triggered the, the combo on that SI7 agent, killed either the Secret Keeper or the Minibot. Uh, but here, he just kind of wants to get a body on board, and I think he may be looking to do something like uh, Edwin coin eviscerate next turn. Yeah, and, and as the Paladin here, you are in a tough position because we've talked about this already on the desk Let several times today, but in, in Secret Paladin, you really do want to have that natural curve out. You want to play the full extent of your mana and get as much value as possible every turn. And Kagloran really hasn't had that opportunity here. He doesn't have all of the tools he'd really like to have available to him. So he's stuck in a position where he does have a very scary board, but he's incredibly weak to the toolkit that Rogue is running. Well, speaking of missing tools, Chess oh, Dude, now he does, find, he does find the Blade Fire. I was going to bring that up. He does not have Deadly Poison or Blade Fire. And that's such an important card, especially looking at Kogloran's board. It was just decimated. You know, he'd have some spiders left over, but that would be really brutal, especially when Kogloran has one card in hand, which if you're Chess Dude, you might safely assume is one of those higher premium endgames game threats that the Paladin goes so for, but uh, being able to clear the board here would be great. Let's look at what he can do, though, with that Blade Flurry. Uh, that secret up there kind of forces Chess Dude to, to play inefficiently, as he probably wants to test out that secret. Yeah, I, I think that the, the secret he wants to test for here, it looks like he is going to check the Noble Sacrifice, which it is. Uh, where this knife goes is pretty relevant, because the uh, SI7 agent could possibly survive combat uh, if it doesn't take that that damage, as it does not here. So yeah, we're, I think we're going to see Coin eviscerate in the Knife Juggler, uh, that SI agent kill one of the minions, I imagine Secret Keeper, and then Edwin come down as a big 6-6 six, six threat. Yeah. The, so brotherhood's suddenly, a, the Brotherhood is alive and well. Yeah. <laughs> and looks like it will prevail, because unfortunately, Kaglorian doesn't have a natural yeah. turn 5 play here at all. And the Noble Sacrifice just isn't going to do the job here. Like, he's now going to be playing from behind for the rest of the game. Th that Noble Sacrifice draw is actually particularly bad in a couple of ways. It's fairly low impact here in general, but also makes his Mysterious Challenger next turn weaker, because he's already played his previous copy of Noble Sacrifice. Uh, now he has no way to get it. Oh, and this... This is a way to buff that Blade Flurry. Uh, Chess Dude does not have the mana to, to make a dagger, play Blood Mage, and Flurry this turn. So uh, that, that's going to be a little bit unfortunate for his ability to just clear immediately. But he's still in a reasonably uh, reasonably strong spot. Now, we talked about the fact that Kulgorin, you know, he's not necessarily in, in the so best space necessarily gosh. because of that Noble Sacrifice draw. But you look at uh, Chess Dude's health, 16. You have minions on the board. And Chess Dude is once again forced to play around the secrets. And he goes, finds that Noble Sacrifice. but. His health is getting low enough to where this is where Secret Paladin can really just start to take over if, on turn six, they have the Mysterious Challenger, which we know Kloglorin does. 
Yeah, Ch Chestu does have almost a clear with this Blade Flurry here. He uh, he will leave up the Minibot, which I, ass he, I assume he may very well just choose to attack into uh, with that Van Cleef because he doesn't want to run the risk of something like a Blessing of Kings coming and ruining his day. And you did see, he did actually try to test and attack the mm -hmm. Minibot, hoping to get the full clear. Didn't expect to see two back-to-back -back Noble Sacrifices. So now, Kaglorin does have Mysterious Challenger on six, which is obviously a massively swingy turn. But with no Noble Sacrifice to protect it, I don't know that this is actually going to work out really well for him. Interestingly, Chess Dude, because there's no Noble Sacrifice, can just sap this. Yep. He can just sap it, and he will just be able to attack with six damage to the face uh, with that that uh, that Van Cleef here. And Kaglorin, he needs some help. He's, he's looking for more Van Cleef right now. Yeah, and seeing those three secrets come down, you can probably safely assume one of them is in Repentance. So your Violet Teacher is actually in a really good spot, too, just going to start generating tokens. And Kuglerin playing this uh, this sort of deck, unfortunately, doesn't have access to tools like Equality. Just get everything off the board. Uh, might have a Consecration, but not going to do him too many favors. And as you pointed out, Kevin, he's pretty much just playing from the back foot. That Owl, though, for Kuglerin was a very good draw. It's able to give him a second body, which enables Avenge, that he can play alongside the, uh, the Shredder, and he's able to neutralize a lot of the threat of that Van Cleef. On the flip side, however, now with second Blade Flurry available to him, Chess Dude can clear the board once again. And like we've already said, Gaglorin doesn't have draw tools. He has very little ability to play from behind. Once he's lost the board here, he's going to be in a really difficult position. And mm. odds are in Secret Paladin, if he's running Consecration, it will be a single Consecration, which means mm. his ability to respond to this Violet Teacher is being diminished rapidly. And ultimately, Chess Dude's going to have a lot of tools available to him to maintain control of this board into the next phase of this game. Ooh, Tinker Sharp Sword Oil is a very powerful draw. Uh, that that can threaten a lot of damage next turn. Chess Dude looks like he's going to try and trigger the uh, combination of Avenge and Redemption that we expect that uh, that Kuglorin has uh, up and waiting. So certainly doesn't want to get uh, the Redemption on a Shredder and generate another minion. Yeah, this is a really tricky situation for Chess Dude here. His HP is very low. We see a 7-5 Shredder. One sap has been used, and... Uh, we see Competitive Spirit only proc on one mini, but that's still eight damage. And if we see something like a true silver come out, that could just be game over two turns. It's, well, I don't know that he's going to get two turns. We do see that Tinker Sharp Sword Oil plus Blade Flurry in Chess Dude's hand, and that is a lot of damage. Yeah, at this point, the biggest risk to Chess Dude would be that he might have the unfortunate outcome that his Violet Teacher creates a token, and that's where the oil ends up. Yeah, I wonder if he actually has enough damage to sacrifice the Violet Teacher and still win. Doesn't look like it, but no, it's so, not quite there. Yeah. Now he can go ahead and, and tinkers. And where does the oil go? It is on the Drake. I, is this lethal? He has uh, 10, 12, 14. He's a point shy. Oh, it's oh, no. so close. Oh. With the spell damage, he has enough. Is it? Yeah, he this is, is actually I think lethal. It is. I believe it is. He has 10, 12, uh, plus. The two spell damage yeah. is enough to push it over. Yeah, Chess Dude's just going to think it over. Just make sure he has it. I was trying to do the math here, but I think you're right. <laughs> it's taking me a little while. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, this is exactly lethal. He's got one extra point here. total. Brian, I've, I've said it before. If you don't play math game, I math can't hurt you. Just <laughs> sit back here. I'm actually just staring at the other two while they're kind of like, come on, guys, give me the answer. I was like, I was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. And I'm trying to add it because I'm trying to like, oh, wait, it's four plus, oh, wait, it's five, not four plus four. This there desk it is. needs a calculator really badly. <laughs> right, and Chess Dude is going to take game one. Actually drops off the BM Darnassus Aspirin on the Shredder. He's like, <laughs> this is bad, but you don't even need to worry about it because you're dead. And for Chess Dude, really well played. As we've said, this is one of those matchups that generally the Rogue is kind of favored in mm -hmm. because the Rogue is really good at just dismantling boards. And uh, I'm sure <laughs> a lot of people at home see that Mysterious Challenger and are used to just kind of going like, <sighs> but Sap, pretty good answer to it. Just puts it back. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah, the, the uh, the, the fact that both of the Noble Sacrifices came out before the Challenger was what right. made the Challenger turn so weak to sap. Because normally, if you are able to get the Noble Sacrifice with your Challenger, you're at least able to generate something that's defending yourself, and you're not just losing all that tempo. But with the both, both Sacrifices down, uh, that sap was huge. Right, and kind of a then and now sort of situation. We look back at the Round of 40 America's uh, Qualifier Tournament last year, and Actually, Secret Paladin was not a big thing. People were like, this deck's inconsistent. I don't necessarily get what I want all the time. Sometimes I just draw secrets. And obviously, in this tournament, it's a way bigger factor. We've seen a lot more of it. But that just goes to how the deck has been iterated upon, mm -hmm. right? That that perfect balance where you try to minimize the risk of just drawing into stuff like Noble Sacrifice twice in a row and ending up in those bad situations where you don't necessarily get those power cards you want. But uh, for Chess Dude, gets that win. That's what's really important. The Rogue is gone. 
Koglaren's going to have all the time in the world to do uh, to do Paladin stuff, but uh, again, we get to go right into game two here, and Koglaren's going to bring out that Warlock deck, and Chess Dude's bringing out the Priest deck, and this has got to be really exciting to watch. Yeah, uh, and we do see the Entomb, uh, Valen's Chosen, and Sylvanas. Sylvanas is a card that actually, for a long time, was pretty much staple in Priest decks, but uh, kind of fell out of favor a little bit uh, more recently. Some decks will choose to play uh, Justicar Trueheart, and you usually do see quite a few copies of uh, Cabal Shadow Priest, which is excellent in this matchup. But Chess Dude Mulligan's a whole hand, and there's a bunch of healing. <laughs> well, and, and this is really tough, right? Because in Priest, you are already the class that has the most significant six drops in the game. You're all really heavy on six. So now he's going to be in a tough spot here. His Mulligan's not really great. It, this is probably not the matchup he wanted with Priest. I don't think he was looking forward to having to play against Zoo because this isn't actually a really strong matchup for him, I don't think. Uh, against Zoo, I, I think that it's it's pretty important that you're able to actually get some reasonable board tempo with minions of your own. Uh, Cleric, not necessarily one of those that's super effective. Uh, the threat here from Chess Dude, he, has, he doesn't have a powered shield or anything like that, so if he played his Cleric and Kogloran just plays a Flame Imp, it's just a disaster. He loses it for nothing, and it's so important to his strategy. There's definitely a high risk associated with it, but if a minion comes down that has less than three attack, you can just start drawing cards, and that's kind of something as a zoo player you really do not want to see. You yeah. do not want to see that Priest get cards, get access to the big combos that are going to wipe the board. Right. And, and this is one of those... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, the Priest is definitely going to be trying absolutely to get as many answers available to them as possible. They want to draw into all of the options that they can find because you just need as many tools in hand as possible. And there's one of those tools that Chess Dude's certainly looking for. The Akonai Soul Priest he picks up off of the... The, you know, clever little heal on his opponent's minion. That's something that some people do uh, do miss now and then. Uh, but that will give him the ability to use that circle of healing as an actual board clear with his Akana. And does leave him, unfortunately, with nothing to follow up here on turn three. Also means he missed out on the really great turn two BM of saying the light shall burn <laughs> you and healing your opponent's face. But this is a pretty classic priest turn of go in the early game <laughs> when you're playing control freeze. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, Akanai Soul Priest, Brian, you mentioned what an important tool that is. Obviously, uh, we've seen Circle of Healing Akanai Soul Priest since the very beginning days of Hearthstone, but Flash Heal with Akanai Soul Priest is also a very, very efficient way to deal with a big minion, or at least a big mid-range minion. Mm -hmm. And leaves Chess Dude right now with a really tough choice. Does he use the Soul Priest Circle right now to all but clear the board and mm -hmm. ultimately end up losing his Soul Priest to the Imp? Or does he hold off and wait to get the value out of that Flash Heal? It also, there's a number, a number of options that Chess Dude is available to. He does have the Powered Shield in his hand, so he could even just wait this turn and heal himself. And it looks like what he's going for, uh, potentially play Akanai Circle and just Powered Shield his Akanai to keep it alive through that and potentially get his opponent to commit more minions to the board right now. Yeah, I want to bring that up. Priest is probably the class that more so than any other class in Hearthstone deals with brinksmanship as a skill. It's one of those things where you're constantly looking at the ability to reset the board and clear, but again, it's a finite number of times you can do it, and you have to wonder, how much damage am I okay with taking? And, you know, to your point, Kevin, if I sacrifice this Akanai Soul Priest now, it's just gone because of the Imp, how do I possibly, you know, have something on the board and start pressing my agenda? So, as you said, Chess Dude passes on that, and to Brian's point, might actually choose to just Power Word Shield on the next turn. Right, I mean, as the Priest, and this is, I think, why we see so little Priest in the tournament environment, is they are fundamentally always the reactive class. You have to respond to the threats that your opponent puts down, and this is an awesome opportunity oh, yeah. for Chess Dude. This is just what Chess Dude is hoping for. Uh, you know, Kogloran, if he, had, if he had wanted to, could have just sat back and used that two extra mana to life tap, and that would have been a, a much better position for him against a possible Akanai Circle, and he can't be happy to see that. His entire board's wiped out. Chess Dude has a minion in play that is resilient to the imp he has, and uh, the board's just reset. But that's a nice draw as well, <laughs> the implosion off the top. And oh, it is two. Oh, that so did not a yell esports. That's a problem. That's <laughs> if you're going to implosion, you got to yell esports. And obviously, we can see Kogler in here. He did not yell esports. I'm not even sure he was heavily thinking esports. And, <laughs> and now, it too. as the zoo player, you're you're thinking really hard that your opponent is now I at the no point in the game where they have access to all of their best tools, and your opponent has a handful of cards and probably a lot of choices. So seeing Sylvanas come down isn't indicative of much, but you have to think very carefully about your lines of play now. All right. So when Sylvanas does come down, she creates his board tension state generally, especially against more board-centric decks like Zoo. How do you approach her? Do you just ignore her? What do you look to do, Brian? It really depends on the game state. Uh, here for Kogloran, yeah, the, the correct answer is certainly Owl. <laughs> he, he has that Owl, not going to find a better use for it. And uh, here, yeah, he just wants to push for face. Uh, it's not going to work out as well as he might have hoped, I think. Uh, ooh, that actually can change things dramatically. The Pyromancer for Chess Dude with a couple of cheap spells in hand, could threaten to pretty much clear Kogloran's board. Yeah, I think there's 
absolutely no world here in which you don't Pyromancer, use the power of a shield on that Pyromancer, heal yourself with the Flash Shield, and just establish your own very powerful board, bring your health total back to a point where you're actually in the dominant position in the game, and your opponent, with only two cards in hand, probably doesn't actually have a lot of choices available to them. And we see the, the Curator uh, come off the top for Chess Dude here. Curator is a card that actually plays a huge role in the resurgence of Control Priest. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues that Control Priest often had is the fact that uh, you will often need to bias your deck toward either beating aggressive decks or controlling decks, uh, which means that you'll often, against controlling, against controlling decks, if you want to have enough tools to beat aggressive decks, not have enough sort of end game action. Whereas Curator can fight for the board a little bit early, it can wear Valence Chosen, which is huge, and also generate big death rattle things in the late game. Right, and so now Kaglorin, he's looking for options, he doesn't have much. The ability to put down Lotheb and deny spells feels really good against Priests as a general rule, but here, you know that you're giving it away to a damaged, silenced Sylvanas. You've spent so many resources on this Sylvanas that you're ultimately not really doing much to advance your own game state. Oh my right. god, Major Domo. <laughs> Major Domo, pick Major Domo. Major Domo. <laughs> Might be a tad on the risky side a against bit, Zoo, a little, maybe. Chess, this is actually amusingly a pretty bad selection for Chess Dude. This uh, might be the worst options I've ever seen out of I a new actually, game the, curator. The be though the beast is fairly strong, um, <laughs> it, it, you will rarely see this card played naturally. That's one of the things I love about, about Curator and Discover in general, is that you, you end up in situations where you see cards that no one puts in their deck, but they can actually end up deciding games. And Zoo has absolutely nothing for removal for this. Like, he, Kaglorin is stuck looking at this board thinking, I'm now fighting for survival. And even with what he's got available to him, he's probably at a point where he has to start life tapping and digging for additional options. Right, an unusual spot for uh, the Priest player. <laughs> it's time to go face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, in general, you don't see the Beast played in decks because if you play it against a deck that Big Game Hunters is, like, okay, well, this is a disaster. Uh, but here, it's, oh, we're playing against, we're playing against Zoo, and now I just suddenly get to play a 9-7 for 6. And uh, also, I get to Cabal, Shadow Priest, your thing, and just smash your face. Well, in Kaglorin, forced to give Let up Brand Bronzebeard, which in this particular matchup has to be really rough because there's so many good things that Zoo can do with Brand Bronzebeard. I, I imagine that this game is effectively over now as Chestu just has such an incredible control over the board. Yeah, and there, <laughs> Kaglorin agrees. He can call it the beast. <laughs> <laughs> How did you figure out from that point in the board, Kevin? This Kevin and I actually used to back in the day podcast <laughs> together. Like Kevin's a really bright guy, and he's like looking at that board. He's like, "Yeah, I, I don't think the, out, I don't yeah. think the zoo player can win this one." <laughs> yeah. Well, he's at nine life. There's a nine seven in play, guys. I'm a prophet. I got this. I got I'm this. a prophet. Yeah, we, usually, <laughs> we usually don't want to just judge games prematurely, but, you know, Kevin, I'm going to give you a pass on okay. that one because I feel like I feel like your heart was in the right place. As a professional esports analyst, I feel like I made the correct call. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't. Can we get that, like, on the, the right place? Professional esports let's not, analyst. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. All right. So, uh, going to tie up the series now. And, you know, we saw <laughs> No, no that's, that's win number that's, two. That's two. That's win number two uh, chess, dude. I got so busy razzing Kevin that I forgot to look at numbers. But, uh, he we is saw, not a professional esports analyst. No, is actually, but. <laughs> this is just going to reinforce his uh, Twitch chat's case against me. But uh, looking at Chess Dude's hand at the end there, he had two Cabal Shadow Priests he had in Tomb. He basically had a response to literally anything a Zoo deck could have played. He's like, Voidwalker, this is mine. Uh, mm -hmm. Imp Gang Boss, this would have been mine. You play like Malganis, this is mine. It just That's what Priest gets to a point when they really stabilize and they get to that point. It's super difficult for the opponent to do anything. And Chess Dude is getting ready to run the 3-0 on Kogloron after Kogloron just ran the 3-0. I mean, it, it's tough, right? Like, I think Chess Dude got all of the answers he needed, and to Brian's point earlier, Kaglorin played way too heavily into that Akanai circle, and now this is probably Kaglorin's best possible matchup with his Zoo deck, but, but he's got to be feeling like he's in a lot of trouble. Well, look at Chess Dude's draw. He has Innervate and Keeper of the Grove along with the Gloin. That's among the best possible cards you're looking for against Zoo. You need to get something on the board quickly and deal with what they can do, and that's exactly what can, right. hand can do. If you're chess dude and you're looking at your hand, you see the Keeper of the Grove and the Innervate, you naturally assume the Knife Juggler is going to get played. I This this is one of those things that casting Hearthstone is really like clockwork. If you see Keeper of the Grove and Innervate in your hand, you know your opponent is going to draw a Knife Juggler and play it, and you're just going to brutally murder it. Please <laughs> stop the violence against gnomes. This is, yeah, this is going to be really unfortunate for Kaglorin again, because he's just not going to get to develop the board. And his hand behind this is okay. He's got some good choices available to him, but ultimately he's going to be really struggling to get the early board development that he really wants. Right, hmm. Brian, uh, Keeper of the Grove uh, into Knife Juggler, how good is it? 
uh, it, it, for, it depends on which side of it you're on. You know, if, if you're chest dude here, it feels good, man. If you're Kaklorin, it is in fact the opposite. It is feels bad, man. The, the polarizing paradigm of feels good, man, feels bad, man. But yeah, uh, Kevin, to your point now, chest dude has the bigger board. Uh, Kaklorin still very early in the game. He's got a lot more uh, early game pressure to put forth. Chest dude, though, in a great spot. Oh, and that, that piloted shutter draw is, is also excellent. He could potentially coin that out this turn if he wants. Uh, or he can he can maybe uh, he can actually he's a couple of options here. The the wrath isn't particularly exciting. He could cycle the wrath if he wanted to uh, to get the the keeper through. He could also just use his hero power and attack. in. there's a number of options, but uh, you know many of them are also just very good. So. Right. I mean, in, in this position, I think when you're already uh, I would say ahead. I think mm -hmm. Chestnut has been able to get really great value. This Keeper of the Grove is absolutely going to, at minimum, two for one. He probably wants to just get more threats on the board. This Coin Shredder really lets him contest the board, which is super important in this particular matchup. Yeah, I, I completely agree with this play. Uh, I think that he could have held the coin and tried to coin five into five, but I think it's against Zoo, it's much more important that you get the sort of immediate board advantage when it's available to you, because usually you're the one playing from behind. And he does have a very natural turn for play. Even if he draws into nothing, he can use Wrath and his hero power as ways to contest the additional things that are going to hit the board here from Kaglorin. Kaglorin going to use this Dark Peddler to fish for some additional options. And these are actually pretty good choices. Uh, corruption isn't bad. Argent Squire, uh, nice as well, particularly with the abuse of Sergeant he does have in his hand. No no Finley love, guys. No, we don't want to give up the, our life tap hero power. <laughs> I was going to say, you already have the hero power your deck wants. You're not going to trade there. So, although trading, speaking of trading, that actually happens. And uh, the Shredder does go down with a, with a panda within. You know, this is why when you're playing as a hunter and the knife juggler dies to a Keeper of the Grove, you just kind of sit there and you you cry a little bit because that's probably game for you. But as it's like, it's okay, I'll just build another board. And, you know, again, Chess Dude was pretty reasonably on the board. Now we look at the situation for Kogloran and, you know, Zoo doing Zoo things. Zoo is doing a lot of Zoo things, but at any point, right, he's played very heavily. Like, Kogloran's style of Zoo here is definitely dump my hand, get everything on the board, see what happens. And if this is a swipe, it's not. But if it had been a swipe, that could have been game ending all by itself. But we go back to last game where, again, he played really heavily into the Akunai Soul Priest Circle of Healing Combo, and he really does not seem to care. He's just, he's going to put his stuff down, and if you have the answer, great. If not, he's just going to pretty much run you over. And I think that in, in this sort of situation, I, I don't think that there's a, another option for Kugler, uh, frankly. I think that it is important for him to try to leverage the potential board advantage where he can get it, because as you get into the later turns, whether it's against Control Priest or against Druid, they just have more powerful things in their deck than you do. Right, fundamentally, Druid is the class with arguably the worst multi-target removal in the game. So as the Warlock player, you really don't have a choice other than to just get as many things on the board as possible and force your opponent to react. Right, we see Chess Dude actually go for the three mana wrath, and generally, it's not something you want to have to do, but in the interest of keeping up on Zoo's board, you know, sometimes you just gotta destroy minions, use the hero power to finish off another minion, and that Keeper of Grove has killed three or four minions now. It's trading very efficiently, and right now, Kaglorin again, just gonna put everything on the board that he can and wait to see what his opponent has to offer. Ultimately, he's actually in an okay position. He hasn't taken any damage from the Druid player. The, the Wrath off the top for Chess Dude is interesting, but he does have a pair of fives. He'd likely want to just play that Druid of the Claw this turn. Uh, it is vulnerable to Kaglorin's board, uh, and, and unfortunately for Chess Dude, it's vulnerable to his board in a way that actually leaves Kaglorin with threats thanks to the, uh, the Imp Gang boss and the Divine Shield on that, uh, that Argent Squire. And behind this, we know that Kaglorin has power overwhelming. Unfortunately, there's no really good natural targets for mm -hmm. it right now. You can play it on the Imp Gang boss and use that to clear the Druid of the Claw, but in this particular board state, you don't really want to. What to do? Right, so for Chess Dude, kind of a glut of options here. I personally like Druid of the Claw, and a lot of times when you're the Druid player and you're in this situation, you see multiple smaller minions, you're like, all right, he has two cards in hand. He's going to do some combination oh, no. of getting rid of this Druid of the Claw. Like, there's no universe where you think it stays, but you're just hoping to exhaust him with more resources. Well, one possible option uh, for Chess Dude is actually Druid as a cat and attack the wolf, because if he does make a bear, it's very vulnerable, and we see exactly that. If he makes a bear, it's very vulnerable to power overwhelming, yep. and I think that he recognizes here that uh, it's very important that he's able to remove that Dire Wolf Alpha from the board. Uh, Abusive Sergeant, an excellent draw for Kuglorin. Right, he's now in a position where he can use the uh, Argent Squire to clear this minion, use Life Tap, find some more options. He does have some really great damage cards in hand, but at this point, you don't want to use Power Overwhelming, and using Doomguard and giving up that Power Overwhelming is also 
ultimately risky in terms of where that leaves you with both board state and how you're going to try to win the game. I really like playing Doomguard on this turn, though. Doomguard is a minion that gives Druid fits. It's just not easy to remove that 5-7 price tag, just a little too much most of the time. And yeah, you're giving up power overwhelming, but you have a really good board. And the only thing that immediately jumps out at you is like, ooh, spooky, is swipe. And there's Swipe. Speaking of which, <laughs> so Spooky is... What am I doing? <laughs> the perfect draw from Chess Dude, Swipe, and that Wrath can clear everything but a 1-1 one, one Imp from Kaglorin. So that was that was a, a huge draw there, giving him the ability to, to pretty much reset what was otherwise a, a really, really difficult board for him to come back from. I mean, I feel bad. Like, I was rooting for Chess Dude going into this. <laughs> but Kaglorin, watching these cards come out, is just looking at this and thinking, I can't establish a board in any of these matchups. Every deck that Chess Dude is running just removes everything I put down. These are great options in a lot of other matchups, but against the Druid, he's sitting there wondering how long he has left until a big combo turn comes down and he's out of the game. Well, there is a second Savage Roar, so it may not necessarily even take a Force of Nature. Well, there's another swipe as well. So Chess Dude with a very strong uh, suite of options in his hand. The big game hunter even giving him insurance against something like a Dr. Boom or, or perhaps a Malganus coming out from Kuglorin as well. Right, and uh, Chess Dude's hand, a little bit awkward right now, but again, just so much raw power, right? Kuglorin's gonna have to pretty much just start digging. He's gonna have to start taking advantage of the two cards per turn, basically, and uh, you know, he's actually not in a terrible spot with these draws. I think in Gang Boss is definitely what you want to be seeing. Uh, obviously, he does a good job contesting board, but you know, he does not know about that second swipe. And unfortunately, actually, the second swipe is not super optimal here. Like, he does have the ability, obviously, to remove the Imp Gang Boss, get rid of the Flame Imp, but he's going to open up both of those Death Rattles with the extra damage, which is actually kind of the opposite of what he probably wanted, ultimately. I think the Ancient of Lore here is really nice, though, because it allows him to fish for one of his forces of nature or just some other way to continue to contest the board. And this is going to give him... Emperor Thorson, which with both of those Savage Roars is insane, and the Mind Control tech, which is obviously a very smart choice, particularly for this matchup. Right, and we see he chooses to draw the cards as opposed to heal. Well, as much uh, damage as was on the board, Brian, do you like that play, or, or do you feel like you had to draw cards there? I, I, I like drawing cards there. Uh, Kaglorin only after the attack has three damage on the board. He does have a number of minions, but none of them are terribly threatening. Uh, though that Void Terror changes the equation a little bit. That is certainly threatening. Uh, giving him a 4-4 in play and uh, the 3-5 as well. 13 damage, uh, 13 life left, rather. Ooh, that's just game. That, that was it. <laughs> I was going to say 13 life left. Kaglorian with Druid's no life left. Force of nature, things. Savage Roar. That's just going to close things out. Yeah, you know, we're busy thinking like, oh, look, mind control tech. We see swipe. A lot of really good tools. But you know what's a really good tool? Just doing a lot of damage. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So Kaglorian's tool. eyebrows are telling the whole story <laughs> here as you just, you just watch him go, well... Right, so Chess Dude is going to take this series 3-0. Very commanding performance, and we talked about the fact that he was bringing kind of an unusual lineup. Did bring Druid, which is not at all unusual, and uh, certainly very well, well represented in this tournament. But uh, again, 3-0, makes it look pretty easy. <laughs> Kogloran's like, but I just 3-0. <laughs> <laughs> very, very uh, rough series for him, but he'll be going down to the lower bracket, so he's not out of it just yet, and he's still got uh, you know more than enough opportunities to to get to that top eight finish and head to the America's Winter Championship next month. And there is something nice to be said for seeing those unusual deck lists get through. I do think there's certain value in trying to kind of work outside the meta, not just bring Secret Paladin mid-range Druid. Like, I think it's really cool to see that his very unique, singularly unique blend of choices for this tournament is doing so well. Yeah, I, th I think people often just vastly overstate how solved the metagame really is at any point. It's like, yes, you will run into powerful decks very frequently like Secret Paladin, like Midrange Druid, uh, but I mean, we just saw you know, Kaglorin uh, get crushed by Rogue and Priest. So uh, th things aren't quite figured out you know, totally just yet. A part of me actually wonders if when we talk about how solved the meta is in that particular conversation, if the real reality of the situation isn't that Secret Paladin, Midrange Druid, arguably even Zoo Warlock, are probably much easier decks to pilot than things like the Rogue deck that we just saw Chess Dude win with. There's a lot of talent and a lot of decision making involved in making a deck like that work. I just want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, Kevin, because I don't want you to say that playing aggro decks is easy. Are you saying <laughs> uh, playing mid? Because uh, Chalky is somewhere watching. I'm here right now, and I will have to defend my honor all right, all right. as an aggro player. But uh, I will say that, especially with these mid-range decks that, that kind of have these high power spikes, yeah, a lot of the times there are going to be situations where you have to kind of figure out like tricksy ways of winning. But sometimes you're just like, I have four mana. 
Pilot Shredder costs four mana. <laughs> that seems pretty good. Yeah, we watched this happen in the last match, right? Where we, or I guess in the priest match specifically, where we were talking about all of the little options and what's going to go on as far as how Chesty is going to make those turns work and all the little decisions that he had along the way, as opposed to Cogloran, who is just like, well, I have minions, the board doesn't. I'm going to play mine. <laughs> right. To be fair, I do think Kegloran played that correctly. I think Absolutely. That, that he, he, was, he Absolutely. was. I think that in many cases, particularly when you're playing the an aggressive deck, you have to just force your opponent to have the answer. And it turned out that Chestu did have the right answer at the right time. Uh, that said, you know, I, I do think that that in many cases, a lot of the decks that people view as being these sort of top metagame decks, they may be decks that are just generally solid and you see all the time on ladder, and that's part of the reason they're perceived as such. But there's a lot to be said for figuring out what those decks' weaknesses are and bringing those to a tournament setting to exploit them. Right, and we're going to head over to the host area where uh, a caster is standing by who is actually getting ready to make his own great charge into the competitive scene in the spring <laughs> season, and that's TJ Sanders, uh, a man who has pretty much all the answers about competitive Hearthstone. Indeed, Rob, most of the time it's uh, players that sort of get washed up and make their way to the caster desk, but I'm going to try and go backwards and make my way into being a player. But we just saw uh, Kagorn fall 0-3 to Chess Dude. Pretty interesting to see him go 3-0 and then 0-3 in spectacular fashion both times. We'll have to check out uh, how he's doing uh, later on in the day. Uh, but I do have some updates from, uh, from across the Americas region for the Winter Preliminary. Uh, there's some, been some notable players who have been eliminated from the tournament. Uh, Demigod from Vicious Syndicate. Uh, you might know him from his Agro Shaman list that I've seen, I'm sure you've seen on ladder. Uh, the Rat, also Death Star, a hunter expert, and uh, now Gaiden, who's uh, one of the South American players playing this tournament. If you play on the North American ladder, you've probably seen him a few times. All of those players have been uh, eliminated. Um, so we'll, maybe we'll see them in spring, but we'll have to see. Uh, a notable matchup to look for uh, coming up soon is going to be Nostum versus That's Admirable. Both these players are tearing through uh, the winner's bracket, so we'll, we'll keep you updated on that one as well. And some all other notable players that have made it on to round three of the upper bracket are, are just saying from Temple Storm, and of course, APX Void, uh, the Temple Mage expert uh, from Hearthlytics. So uh, that's what's been going on on the off stream uh, matches. But make sure you guys are, are letting us know who you're rooting for. Stay engaged on social media. You can use the hashtag HCT. Uh, you can head over to Facebook.com slash Hearthstone. Uh, but head on Twitter. Uh, we're featuring a lot of tweets uh, from, from you guys on the stream. So uh, if you want to uh, stay engaged with us and maybe have a chance to see your own words. Uh, be written across the screen, then head over and use that hashtag uh, HCT. But we're going to have to go to a quick break before we jump into the next match. Uh, the next matchup is a good one, though. It's going to be one of the warrior gods of old, Kit Kats. He's going to take on the Brazilian player Lucas in our next match on the stream. So don't go anywhere. More Hearthstone Championship Tour action continues right after this.